<clears throat> so, welcome. Uh, so I wanted to, to start by saying a few words about uh, kind of Effie's vision for ecological forecasting and some of the goals of the workshop. Um, so first of all, you know, we're kind of a workshop about the ecological forecasting. How do we, uh, I always use this uh, paper from Clark in 2001 as kind of the, the in my mind, it's an initial seminal paper in this area, really defining what ecological forecasting is, the process of predicting the state of the systems, the system services, and active capital, which is fully specified in uncertainties, and you continue to find explicit scenarios for things like climate change, population, etc. Um, I feel like I should probably hold the thing that ends up being all the hard work here ends up being that fully specified uncertainties part. Um, so, so why forecast? Why do we care about forecasting ecology? It's not something as a discipline we've really spent a lot of time actively trying to do. Uh, so first and foremost, um, because decisions are about the future. So we are living in a world that is uh, out there. Uh, so we're, we're environmental conditions are constantly changing. Uh, we're essentially in a non-steady state, no analog environment. And a lot of the traditional assumptions under uh, natural resource management, not just water management, but uh, and all of natural resource management, has been based on these ideas of, of, kind of historical stationarity, which is no longer you know, necessarily the best point of reference. And so decisions about the future, how can, can uh, scientists help inform environmental decision making? Well, one way we can do that is to actually provide our best explicit predictions what we think will happen in the future, uh, which is essentially what forecasting is. So it's over the years ecologists have been trying to get better at forecasting. Uh, I myself have spent a lot of time in the last 20 years thinking about uh, climate change responses of the terrestrial ecosystems. And this is, in, in my community, a fairly famous set of figures uh, coming out of the last two IPCC reports looking at uh, the uncertainty in the, the total global carbon land flux, um, each of these lines is a different uh, global Earth system model making predictions up to 2100. Uh, I, I like to joke the biggest difference in the seven years of effort here was the change in color scheme. Um, <laughs> because there's still a considerable amount of uncertainty. And, and I haven't spent decades banging my head against those sorts of uncertainties. One of the things I've, I've really come to notice in the last refocus on the last few years is that uh, I, I make countless projections of 2100 and I have no idea if I'm be good at it because I've never validated that. I've never jumped into time machine on the 2100 and see if I'm any good at predicting 2100. Uh, by contrast, I, I can make a prediction of what is going to happen this summer and I'll know later this summer if I'm any good at that. Um, so I, one of the things I point out, would like to point out here and one of the things that FC is trying to emphasize is that well, long, these sorts of long-term projections are important. They've been kind of the mainstay of what a lot of our communities have been thinking about. Also, to kind of think about re, kind of swing the pendulum back a bit to also think about what can we do in, in shorter time scales where we can make projections that are, are verifiable, testable, uh, and, and give us feedback about how well we're actually doing. And, and there's a lot of evidence from a wide range of disciplines is become good at making predictions, you have to get that feedback about how you're doing. You have to get continual feedback about, uh, you, know, you make predictions, you see what happens, you confront that with reality, you update your understanding. So this idea of a feedback loop and a learning loop, in many ways, think about forecasting as a way of accelerating that learning loop. So what do I mean by kind of near-term ecological forecast? So this is an example of my own group thinking about uh, making projections on much finer time scales than a lot of us were trained as as ecologists. So these are actually a forecast and fall chronology that were, um, I think I would learn at this point, and that would bring my phone with me when this is really, it's, uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's not the first time this has happened. Um, so, so these are projections of fall chronology being updated on a daily basis. So every day we update the forecast of the fall, leaf fall, Using multiple data constraints, so using both uh, uh, webcam based observations on the tower and satellite based observations remotest. 
these sort of approaches of thinking about forecasting ecology on the near term are starting to take off of a really, really broad range of uh, disciplines. These are all example systems where, where real time forecasts are actually running. Of, uh, and then they span uh, the terrestrial, freshwater, and marine systems. They span the ecosystem versus the, the biodiversity. Uh, and they don't just include observational systems. Uh, three of these are actually represent experimental manipulations. So this is a, a drought manipulation experiment, a temperature manipulation experiment, and a long term drug biodiversity uh, in the southwest, all of which are being forecasted. So what has made this, one thing that's made this possible, this kind of revolution in thinking about uh, predictability on shorter time scales is, is that you know, over the last decades, our ability to make measurements uh, has really changed. We are able to do real-time monitoring, and, and that really has opened this door to thinking about doing real-time science. So not just forecasting, but just science in general, being able to bring the time scales of, of our, our thinking, our inference, and our prediction uh, to closer to real time. And being, in that way, being more responsive uh, and, and again, short, uh, accelerating this learning cycle. Uh, in, the, in addition to individual instruments, we've had a, an increase in the degree to which ecologists have been thinking about at larger scales as research networks. So I'm showing that from NEON, but there's a, a wide range of other. Uh, science networks that have grown up over the last decade or two. Some of these are very top down. A lot of these, like EPI, are very grassroots. They've grown up from communities trying to self organize towards making uh, network observations. And then, of course, we have a wide and increasingly diverse and, and amazing set of satellite observations uh, providing you know, near real time measurements from uh, the top down on a wide range of different. Platforms, and then one of the things I also think is really, uh, really essential to a lot of ecological forecasting processes is to tap into uh, the, the power of, of community science. Of, of the, the fact that community scientists are able to make measurements on scales that are, are often impractical uh, to individual research PIs, and, and can do so in ways that are actually very responsive. To our forecast. So, so one example I really like is, you know, uh, National Technology Network. You know, they have an app that helps citizen scientists uh, participate in uh, monitoring uh, phenology. But they are also making forecasts of phenology. You can actually then use those phenology forecasts to help notify users of that app in certain places in space and time. Where, you know, here would be a good time to make phenological observation because something interesting is likely to happen soon. Uh, so that we can, can increase the data density in the places and the times that are, are actually the most important to make measurements. That's something that, you know, I can never do that with one or two grad students. I can't cover a whole continent. Uh, even Neon can't cover the whole continent at that, that, you know, adaptiveness uh, in space and time. And then the other thing that I think that really is in, gotten me very excited about this idea of iterative forecasting is the degree to which I think is a win-win for both making our science more societally relevant, but also improving the way we do our science, period. So I really think that uh, forecasting is, is one epitome of how we think about the scientific method. So we start with you know, the formation of hypotheses, and in forecasting, the, the quantitative models we use to make predictions are just a mathematical embodiment of those hypotheses. We then Use those to make predictions. Uh, those predictions are, are, are quantitative, specific, and falsifiable, which is actually a big difference than a lot of what ecologists have done in the past. I mean, I, I'll be honest, I think we've let ourselves off easy uh, for a long time by making predictions that were very vague. You know, I think X will affect Y. Right? If we're feeling bold, I think X will increase Y. That's a bold ecological prediction. By <laughs> contrast, um, we can actually make predictions that, that have specific numbers to them and thus are, are much more falsifiable. And then updating those with observations and repeating this on a cycle that is much faster than we have in the past. And we can learn from quicker. And essentially, we learn quicker by failing quicker. So, one of the key ideas of, of iterative forecasting is, 
is to fail early and fail often, but to learn faster than that. I also think that forecasts provide us uh, one way of tackling this crisis of reproducibility that's facing a lot of science because our forecasts are always made a priority. They're essentially a pre registration of what we think is going to happen done before the observations are, are made. And then all of our validations are, are always out of sample because we're always predicting something that's in the future. The data, it's hard, it's hard to overfit something when the thing you're trying to validate against hasn't happened yet. So to come back to this uh, diversity of forecasts that have uh, been increasing rapidly, um, this comes this kind of uh, leads me to one of the core principles that Ethne was founded around uh, when we came together as a community to kind of uh, launch this initiative, which was our, our central goal was really to build a community of practice. So what we had seen up to now was that, that, that there were these initiatives, you know, from disease folks to start making predictions, from carbon folks to make predictions, from marine mammal folks to start making predictions. And they were also often some communities that were doing this not knowing what was going on in each other's communities. And so what we really wanted to do with FE and, and with this meeting being a big kickoff of that is to provide a venue for people working in very different systems uh, to come together and try to build a community, to kind of start seeing ourselves as a community rather than people working in, in different areas. Uh, so we launched uh, the web page last year. Um, some of the things you'll find on that web page are some of the profiles of, of the forecasts that folks have registered. If you have a project that's not listed up there, let us know because we really would love to, to list the different forecasts going on in community just to show the breadth and provide one place that people are first in this area they can go to see what everyone else is doing. Uh, we've provided access to educational resources. Uh, so there's my book that came out a while ago. When I wrote that, I thought that you, know, you finish what you did, that's the end. Uh, and that, that was really just like the beginning. It's gotten far harder since that's been done. Um, Highlighting some of the courses that we know are out there. A lot of these courses have open materials uh, that you can go to and, and kind of see what's going on in those, uh, as well as things like summer workshops going on for folks interested in, in training in this area. Uh, but the core of, of FE is organized around these six cross cutting themes. And that these, the idea of these cross cutting themes is that these are areas of research that we think. Are, are shared across the ecological forecasting community regardless of what you're working on. So regardless of whether you uh, are, are studying you know, ticks or phenology or microbes, um, you know, a lot of these areas still apply to so, so theory and synthesis. So thinking about uh, the predictability of ecological systems, the theory behind forecasting, the synthesis across forecasts, the learning at a higher level, uh, the decision science and the social science side of this of learning how um, how decision makers are actually using the forecasts we're making, how to provide those in a more informative way to communicate in uncertainty efficiently. Uh, the cyber infrastructure needs, you know, one of the things that is I think a bottleneck for a lot of folks when they get forecasts up and running is just learning the, the informatics tools uh, and, and building these workflows. That, Keep, keeping them running. It's one thing to, to write a model for these predictions, it's a very different thing to have that run every day. And uh, it, I think it really is a bottleneck uh, to a lot of us. Um, it's keeping these to a select subset of the ecological community that's on the geekier end of the uh, distribution. Uh, the statistical methods and tools that are used by our community. Uh, the, the important need for, for education and, and inclusion in this community, the training, uh, in language training is also a real bottleneck for a lot of folks. Uh, and then you know, uh, knowledge transfer and, and partnerships, so how to work uh, towards the co-production of ecological forecasts that, are, that involve multiple stakeholders, and not just academics making something and pushing it out, uh, but it's the academics working with agencies, working with NGOs, working with citizen science. Uh, to work together uh, towards collaborative forecasting efforts. So, some at a high level, the overarching question of, of the growth of launch of this meeting is, is fairly simple. What are you just doing in these different focal areas, and what more can be done? So, if you look at the schedule for, for the week, it's, it's 
organized around these six themes, uh, as well as the, the questions that were sent out ahead of time, and it, folks thinking in these thematic areas. So with the cross of meeting, one of the things we're aiming to do is, is start by um, we have a few brainstorming sessions across the part of the floor this week, particularly in the early part of the meeting, uh, to start getting the ideas and questions that are emerging from all of our discussions. And we want those to be very initially very interdisciplinary discussions. Uh, later in the week, uh, well, later in the meeting, the middle of the week, uh, what we're going to try to do is really congeal those uh, next steps into. Uh, and deal with those ideas and questions as to what concretely are some of the next steps we want to take as a community in each of these thematic areas. And then, and then for Epi, more broadly, we are treating this workshop as essentially the launch for, for more persistent working groups around each of these themes. So there will be an opportunity, particularly on uh, Tuesday afternoon and then again on Wednesday, to start to come together instead of randomized writing groups, but come together with folks who are interested in specific thematic areas and to come together and thinking about you know uh, how to start uh, moving forward and what each of those different work groups would like you know, want to work on moving into the future. Uh, the other thing that I think is worth noting is that uh, this workshop and, and I think more broadly uh, kind of emerged out of some earlier workshops that we've run um, and, and while those workshops uh, did have a mix of academic and agency folks and did have uh, our, our one token social scientist, thank you, Melissa. Uh, <laughs> uh, the, the, one of the real goals for this meeting was to, to really broaden that dialogue. So if this meeting's in DC, not Boston, where I am, which would have been far easier for me, uh, because the agencies are here, the NGOs are here, the industry is here. Um, and so really, the you know, goal for us this week is to really build those bridges and cross, cut across multiple agencies, uh, academia, and, and other community and NGO groups. Uh, and likewise, to cut across disciplines as well. So one of the things that, that has emerged from our thinking about these six themes is, is the real realization that ecological forecasting is not an ecology problem. It is an interdisciplinary problem that really requires expertise that spans uh, the biological, social, physical, and computational sciences. You know, this is not something that can just be done by one of us. And I think that the synergy across disciplines and synergy across uh, academia, agencies, et cetera, it is really what's going to uh, make this a powerful new research area. Um, and that's what I have for the general introduction. Oh, yes, <laughs> I will mention our, our, our funders, but I want to definitely thank uh, the Sloan Foundation for providing the bulk of the funding for this meeting, as well as the, the Cardi Center, who generously contributed not just time, but a lot of manpower towards getting uh, this up and running, providing all the folders. Uh, and then uh, we have some money from uh, NSF. Office of International Science and Engineering to provide some of our travel scholarships, particularly for the international scholars that were able to make it uh, through those tra travel fellowships. So we have our lightning, our first session lightning. Here. If you're in this first session, raise your hand. There should be four of you. Perfect, I see all four of you. Excellent. <laughs> so we want to load up the first. Cool, so, so I was, I have like, oh, you're I, have, okay. I have a few slides to introduce this theme. So one of the things that we're going to try to have as a repeating pattern in each of these six thematic sessions. Is someone from FE providing a little bit of introduction in context to how we're thinking about these problems? Uh, and then uh, a keynote talk uh, from someone you know, discussing yeah, a keynote in each of these areas, uh, then a set of lightning talks, and then uh, because lightning talks come fast and furious, uh, a set of panel discussions after that. So this, this one's going to break the pattern here. It's going to we can hear that. Uh, but so I'll give a lightning introduction, then we'll do the four um, uh, lightning, contribute lightning talks, and then we'll reserve the questions to all five of us till the end. Um, and then after that, we'll have our first talk here. Okay, didn't mess that up. Cool. Okay, so the first thematic area here is theory and synthesis. 
Uh, so what do we gain by experiencing this? Uh, so one thing that's really drives me conceptually as an ecologist, particularly one who's been a bit on the quantitative side of the discipline for a long time, is can we forecast ecology the same way we forecast others? You know, can we, uh, you know, like I said, have this fast repeat cycle, uh, but can we, are we also going to be any good at it? And what, and do we face, what are the forecasting conceptual challenges and theoretical challenges that we face in the discipline? Are they the same that are faced by weather forecasting in other disciplines? So one of the things that I, I think a lot about in kind of the theoretical side of, of forecasting is we want to be able to predict things and how do we measure predictability? How do we know if we're any good at predicting things? Uh, so I'm going to use this figure to kind of explain my thinking here. Uh, so I'm going to first think, say that uh, for the y-axis is in uh, predictive uncertainty, x-axis could be time or space. You start out with some initial uncertainty. Uh, and in some sense, your, your uncertainty about the present is actually more a reflection of your ability to measure the present monitoring effort than it is about your ability to predict the future. So some initial condition uncertainty that's really a reflection of monitoring. And then we're going to assume that as you make the prediction out in the future, that, that prediction becomes progressively more uncertain. If you, if you write a forecast and you just realize that you are more confident about the future than you are at the present, you should stop. <laughs> you should be a little worried. Uh, I would generally be concerned. <laughs> okay, so some things that, that then affect this idea of predictability. One is the, the rate at which that uncertainty grows into the future, and then the limit of that predictability is kind of at what point do our forecasts do, do no better than chance? Right? And it defines that limit of predictability. Um, and then to make my first tie to the, the decision sciences is, is the realization that uh, those scales of, of predictability may, may or may not match the scales that are useful decision makers. So we may have some set of times and spaces that, that they do overlap and some set that they don't. And that's actually a really interesting, you know, just basic science question of you know, the, the, the scales that we can predict things and are, are they actually useful? Um, so to unpack the, this growth rate and uh, uncertainties, uh, I will say that I'm going to break this down into uh, five terms, five things that affect the predictability, five uncertainties that affect the rate at which the, our predictable uncertainty grows. And it basically breaks down into the contribution to, from the internal dynamics and stability of ecological systems. Uh, there's responses to external forcing, such as weather, our ability to constrain the parameters in our model, uh, the inherent uh, heterogeneity and variability in natural systems that is what statisticians often use random effects to capture, and the residual unexplained process error. So if we look at uh, the example of weather forecasting, which is many, you know, maybe acts as a useful uh, point of reference for thinking about ecological forecasting. Uh, one of the things that was discovered uh, by Lorenz back in the, the early, late 50s, early 60s was the fact that uh, the atmosphere is inherently chaotic, it's an unstable system. Because the atmosphere is unstable, the, uns the growth rate of the uncertainty in weather forecasting is dominated by initial condition uncertainty. So to predict weather farther out in the future, you need to constrain your initial conditions better or better right now. So the farther we want to forecast, the better we need to know what's going right now. Essentially, that is such a dominant uncertainty that these other five terms get swamped. Uh, that, that theoretical realization of what drives the predictability of that system uh, then drove you know, 60 years and billions and billions of dollars of investment in actually how you do weather forecasting. And I think an interesting point on the ecological side is, is we are starting to try to make predictions without answering and often without asking what uncertainties are dominating ecological predictions. Um, so this framework of thinking about the dominant uncertainties is, is one that has a lot of theoretical implications, but it's also one that we can apply pragmatically and start doing comparative analyses so we can actually ask, ooh, that didn't sound right. Um, there should be a dark green blob here and a very tiny, tiny black uh, initial condition uncertainty in both of these. Uh, but they're, they're 
you can think about making comparative analyses across different systems. So this is you know, a lake forecast on the, on the left and a, a carbon, potential carbon forecast on the right. And you can see that there are some issues, but there's also some differences in what drives the uncertainties. Uh, so one of the things that we've been thinking a lot in, about FB is, is the need to have some archives for the forecast that folks are making uh, to, to allow us to test theories, to allow us to do independent validation, and, as well as to improve dissemination of these forecasts. And some of the things we'll talk about later in the week with stats and standards and segment structure are kind of key parts of making that happen. Uh, but there's also these kind of oh, uh, deeper ecological questions about predictability, the things that, that might influence it. You know, how much of the ecological predictability is due to evolutionary constraints or biological traits or the physical environment or ecological interactions? And then there's a whole set of analogous theoretical <laughs> questions about the transferability of ecological models that we use today to forecast. And so the same factors uh, drive the predictive, our ability to forecast similar problems. So to kind of sum up, uh, this question about the nature of predictability is a lot of the theoretical interest of understanding ecology, what drives dynamics, the generality of ecological processes. Uh, has a lot of practical implications because it helps us better understand what we can predict and how to tackle new forecasting problems. And has a lot of methodological implications because like with weather forecasting, what we measure, how we build our models, and how we assimilate our, our data into models is ultimately driven by knowing what type of prediction problems we have. And to kind of sum all of that up, the goal of the theory area in FE is, is to really think about to what extent is nature predictable. Uh, I think the alternative is, is something that leads to the pressing thought that is all, ecological, all ecological studies are just case studies. That every ecological study is unique. There's a unique case study, there's no overarching synthesis. To me, I think that uh, you know, turns ecology into post stand collecting. I think there is uh, some really great, interesting questions to be asked about these overarching questions about predictability. To me, it's, it's been really Revitalized the way I'm thinking about ecology and thinking about uh, a really interdisciplinary way of thinking across the schools where I now have folks in my lab who are disease ecologists and microbial ecologists and studying ecology and thinking about overarching questions that span for all of them. Okay. So thanks for seeing that. Okay, Lynn.